Okay, thank you. So 10 Wireshark tips in 10 minutes, I hope. Um, I'm sorry it's going to go really fast. So if you can't watch, can't keep up, please do watch the recording later. So tip number one, more data is important. Analysis is a, is a puzzle game. You don't want to leave any clues behind. So do not use a capture filter because that tells Wireshark only to take the frames out of the air that you've filtered for. We don't want that. We want every frame available. So don't use capture filters. And uh, when you get the data later on and to an analyze it, apply display filters instead. That way you get all the data and you can throw away the clues you decide you don't need. But analyzing large PCAPs is really slow to do. Wireshark's not very good at large data sets. So if you do need to capture over more than a couple of minutes, apply a ring buffer so it's creating multiple little PCAPs for you. And then when you find the one that the problem exists in, you can work through that file a lot quicker than if you're working with a PCAP over an hour long. Tip number two, layer three who? Wi-Fi is a layer one and two technology. All the, all the clues we need to solve a Wi-Fi problem are on the unencrypted Wi-Fi headers on layer one, layer two, even on encrypted SSIDs. So don't worry about trying to capture the handshake between the clients. You can later on try and decode the, the payload. We don't need to do that. That means that packet slicing, which is employed by things like the uh, Sidekick and the Ybot sensor, is OK, because they throw away the data. But I don't care for the data. I want the headers. And that's the part, the crucial part they keep for us. If you are wanting to see layer three data, so you're looking at IP or DNS or DHCP, then you probably don't need to be capturing over the air roaming. You probably can do that from an AP or a controller instead. And that'll give you unencrypted captures of the full stack. Okay, tip number three, change your layout. The default Wireshark layout is not good for packet analysis. You get a skinny window at the top that doesn't show you many frames, a skinny window in the middle that doesn't show you all the frame contents, and then this window at the bottom just contains jibber-jabber as far as I'm concerned. To change your appearance, to go for the, the layout where it's number one, pane down the left-hand side, number two and three stacked on the right, but disable pane three, turn it off so that you get rid of that jibber-jabber. That way you've got down the left hand side one, down the right hand side two, and you end up with this, which gives you a whole load of frames on the left. I can see so many more frames to analyze what's going on. And on the right, I can see everything I need to see without having to scroll too much. Tip number four, columns are really easy to apply on Wireshark and they really change the view of the data you're looking at. They're very powerful for seeing how is the environment changing. And they're so easy to apply. You just find a frame that you're caring about, if it's something generic, like a data rate or a frequency, they're in every frame you capture, so you can choose any frame. You find the parameter you want to look at, you right click, and you say apply as column. And it will just throw that as a column for you so you can watch it. And then if you look here, I've applied the data rate column. I can very quickly and easily see the health of my data going across. Why is it rate shifting? I can go look at that more if I care. Tip number five. Forget about source and destination. They're the default columns in Wireshark, but Wi-Fi has four addresses, and those two are the least important. If we look at this example, here it seems, quite honestly, we've got one Apple client transmitting to another Apple client via the same BSSID, but I've got a massive jump in sequence number. Where's all my data gone in between? Well, if I hide the source and destination and reveal the transmitter and receiver instead, we can say, actually, this is two separate frames, one going up from an Apple device to the BSSID, and then one coming down from BSSID to a different client. So you're looking at two different segments of the network there. OK, tip number six. Do not sort by columns. As I say, Wireshark's not great at large data sets. When you apply a filter, it takes time to filter your data and show you what you want. If you also have a sort on, that's a second transaction after the filtering that it runs through to make sure it's in the order you want. So do not sort by column if you can avoid it. Unfortunately, it happens by accident. You click on column and, and trigger a sort when you're moving around, resizing. So where you can, just be careful when you're moving resizing columns. Unfortunately, the, well, the default sort or the default layout in Wireshark is to sort by the packet number. It shows you how it is in the PCAT file as it was captured, which is by frame number. Um, but you can't just say, well, I'll undo my column sort by sorting out by, num by the frame number. That doesn't undo the sort. That just changes you to a different sort, which is now by frame number. So unfortunately, if you do trigger a, a column sort, either deliberately or accidentally, the best way is copy your filters, you go to save, then actually close a PCAP and reopen it. Seems silly, but this, will, this 30 second process will save you minutes and minutes of analysis of processing that sort over and over again, which you don't really want because you've gone back to sorting by frame number. Okay, tip number seven. 
all the data is in Wireshark, and yet I see so many people transcribing into Notepad++ or emails or reports details from Wireshark. Just copy it out of there. That way you can't make any mistakes. But you need to copy at the right level, and I think people make this mistake. Um, if this is all collapsed, all the frame deals were collapsed, it would look like, well, I can see up at the top row there, my SSID parameter is voice-dot-one-x. Great, I'll copy that. But that's the summary of that information element. When you want to copy, you need to expand down to the individual parameter, and then all of your copy items come alive. Otherwise, some of them are grayed out. Useful things to copy. Copy is value. You can copy out a BSS ID, you can copy out a Mac, and you can throw that into a troubleshooting, a CLI capture. You know, it's horrendous running a debug and then finding you put the wrong Mac address in in the first place. So don't go, don't go to doing typos that way. Copy is filter. Again, you can take that parameter and that value, and Wireshark will tell you the filter for it. You don't need to know all these filters, it will tell us. Um, this is good for sending it to a colleague if you want them to inspect a PCAP. It's good for putting into a report saying this is the filter I applied and this is what this, the data showed me. And one that I use an awful lot, but I don't think a lot of people know about, is copy all visible items. If a client says to me, um, my client will connect this AP but not that AP, well I'm playing spot the difference. I need to know why one AP is good and one AP is bad. So I will get a beacon um, or a probe response or the association response from both APs. Open in Wireshark, I'll right click and expand all the information elements, I'll right click, copy all visible items, and that dumps the entire frame content into the clipboard for me. Dump that into Notepad++ for both the good and the bad, compare, boom, what's the difference between these two BSS IDs? That solves an awful lot of problems for our customers. Okay, tip number eight, measure twice, cut once, something my dad taught me a long time ago. Every time you filter in Wireshark, it has to re-display your data, and it takes time. It's probably the slowest part of analyzing is actually waiting for Wireshark to do what you're telling it to. Using the apply as filter, immediately applies the filter without giving you any option to build up a filter, add more filters to it, edit the filter. And so you have to sit through that process of it applying. What, people, what you really want to do is you prepare as filter. It does the same thing. It tells you that filter you're looking at for the parameter you've selected, but it doesn't apply it. It lets you go and modify that. So I, instead of finding an exact beacon for the exact BSS ID I want, I can find any beacon, I prepare that as a filter, but then modify the BSS ID to be the one I want to look at. So don't use apply as filter because you'll go through that filtering process unnecessarily. Just prepare as filter, then go and modify it. Add your, add your filters on. Which brings me to uh, number nine. What don't you want to see? 8 to 11 PCAPs are daunting, hundreds of thousands of lines at times. Um, and I think a lot of people don't do it because they just feel lost. You do not need to know what you are looking for. We don't open PCAPs and go, well, I'm just going to apply this filter and I'll find the problem. It's a troubleshooting game. It's, it's analysis. We have to get, go through the clues. So we have to hide what we don't want to see to show us what we actually care about. And to do that, you build up filters as you troubleshoot using the preparers filter option. And that's two or three filters at a time often. You can do this two ways. You can do a positive filter. This is where you ask Wireshark to only show you certain frames. But that, that means you need to know what you want to see. And I think the real trick that a lot of people forget is you can do negative filters. Do not show me something. So if you look at this example here, I'm filtering for everything transmitted by a certain BSS ID. And I happen to be looking here at an association from a client. But I've got beacons everywhere. It's almost 50% of my capture, so it's really muddying the water. So I just apply a negative filter after the positive. So I say, show me transmissions by this SSID, but do not show me beacons. And suddenly my data is more compact. All I'm seeing is the probe responses to the client, the um, request from the client, the, the, um, the handshake, the key messages. So remember, you don't have to know what you're looking for. Just know what you don't want to see. Get rid of that and everything else will surface. Okay, tip number 10. Counting in milliseconds is hard, for me at least. It's a time construct we don't work in. We work in minutes and hours and days. We don't work in milliseconds. So there's a lovely little tool that not many people use, which is um, the time reference feature. And this allows you to set any frame as a time reference, i.e. a zero value. And the frames after that count up in milliseconds. So you can very quickly see the length of time after an event occurred. It's really good for seeing how long an association took, like dot one X, or maybe how often your client is roaming. So maybe on average it roams every five minutes, but then it starts roaming every 30 seconds. So you just find the first frame you care about. In this case, from a screenshot, I've chosen the first authentication frame. I've right clicked and I've set, set time reference. We get a reference field, we get a reference value in the time column, 
and everything afterwards counts up. So I just go to the very last key message or the very first data frame, whichever you care about, and I can very quickly see, oh, 350 or 386 milliseconds. I've not had to take some milliseconds away from another milliseconds to get to a certain value. Tip number 11, uh, what? If you want to watch more, um, Eddie did a great 30 minute talk at Adobe PLC previously. If you want even more than that, I did a talk that Keith just talked about. Thank you very much. Do reach out if you have any questions.